Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see everyone this morning. We, uh, yeah, I know what I want to do. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank uh, Pastor Noah for his really excellent message last week. If you were, yeah, let's, uh, if you were here, you heard that. And uh, he challenged us, uh, you know, to learn from students to think big and sometimes think outside the box. Students are pretty good at that. And, uh, you know, to, to think outside the box in the way that we serve God, because God just might want to call us to do something that's a little different and a little bit unusual. And uh, those were good words. So here's what I'm going to say, Noah. Congratulations on your first major league at bat. Okay, that was the first time he'd preached on a Sunday morning, so it was awesome. Um, hey, we're starting a new five-week series today, and I'm calling it Catching God's Vision for the World. And uh, I just want to ask, is there anything in following Christ that is more important than understanding what God is doing in the world? where all of this is going, where it's leading, and uh, knowing what God's priorities are, too. Uh, I think churches do a good job of, um, you know, helping people understand God's priorities for their day-to-day lives, and, you know, sometimes it's framed in, you might say, the negative. It's about the sins we should avoid. But I don't know that churches always do a great job of kind of giving us the big picture. And that's what we're going to be after in this series. The big picture of what God is doing in the world. The long-term direction. Where is he trying to get this world to? That's the question I want us to look at this morning. Now, it is unusual, uh, but every so often a movie will come along. Uh, that sort of violates the normal conventions of storytelling. And what I mean by that is that stories are normally told chronologically, you know, from beginning to end. But sometimes there's a, a movie that tells the end first, you know, and then you spend the movie kind of trying to figure out how we get there. And it's a little bit more difficult way to do storytelling because when the audience already knows the ending, it can be harder to hold on to their attention. A film that works that way is uh, the social commentary. It's really pretty hard-hitting film called Crash that explores this issue of prejudice in the human heart. And uh, it starts out with a body by the side of the road. Somebody's been killed. And then it tells the story with a lot of sort of jumping around to different places, different sequences, different vignettes of how we got to that point. You know, the Bible sort of works that way. God likes to do a lot of what I call fast forwards where he gives us a glimpse of what the future holds, and it's embedded in lots of things that are going on in the scriptures. But he certainly did this with the prophets, didn't he? Isaiah in particular. And then you find it also in this big, huge, grandiose way in the revelation given to St. John, to the Apostle John, and we call it the Revelation. And it's this picture of the world that is to come. Think about it uh, in novels. I'm not a huge reader of fiction, but I do love all of the lawyer novels of John Grisham. Okay, so when one of those comes out, you know, I'm just all over it, right? My wife knows she's always going to be a great, great present, okay? And I just get so wrapped up in those. And don't you, you just, you just kind of get wrapped up in the plot. Does this ever happen to you? And you just can't wait for the ending. You're just so eager to know where it's all leading and what it's going to happen, you know. And, I, and I, I admitted this in the last service. I just about got ran out of the place. But I told them sometimes when I read one of those novels, not always, but sometimes, I cheat. I jump ahead to the end. I read the last ten pages so I know how it's going to end. 
man, I, I'm glad I've got somebody who, that's okay with them, but I, yeah, you too, and somebody here, but I mean, they were ready to throw stuff at me. They just couldn't believe it. It's not a moral issue, okay? All right, sometimes I do that. Not all the time, okay? Because sometimes we just want to know what the ending is. Well, God's given us this beautiful picture of the world that is to come, where this world is leading. Let me ask you this question. When you travel someplace, don't you like to know where you're going? I mean, if somebody says, pack for a four-day trip, what's your next question? Where are we going? When you jump on the I-90 and you're heading over Snoqualmie Pass, wouldn't you like to know what the destination is? Huh? Is it Spokane? Is it Missoula? Is it Chicago? Is it Cleveland? Is it Buffalo? Is it Syracuse? Is it Boston? We like to know that, don't we? And we should bring that attitude to the scripture when we read it we want to know hey God where is this whole thing going what are you doing in the world so Revelation chapter 21 gives us some of those answers and you know what God is not keeping secrets he's telling us where this world is headed in John's vision when linear history gives way to eternal reality Christ will regenerate everything. The world will be brand spanking new. God's will, his redeeming purpose will have been accomplished by, listen to this, taking us forward to the beginning. That's what God's doing. He's moving us forward to the beginning. I know you've heard about the Back to the Future films, but no, this is forward to the beginning. This morning I want to call attention to three aspects of this newness that God tells us is coming. Here is the first one, a new world. Redemption in Christ, folks, is so radical, so complete that the world we live in, both the terra firma and the heavens around it, will get a complete makeover. The old earth will be enveloped by the new. And some things are going to be very, very different. Now, first we're told there are going to be no oceans in the new world. And that's different because like three-quarters of the world we live in is water. It's oceans. There's no oceans. Ah, but we have to remember we're told that that new world is watered by this great river that flows, called the river of life, that flows from the throne of God and the throne of Christ. You can read that in chapter 22 of Revelation. We remember that oceans represented nothing but trouble for the people of the ancient world. They teemed with creatures that people feared. Their storms were unforgiving. They represented unrest and unpredictable change. No one ever embarked on a sea journey without wondering if they would actually arrive at their destination. And think of the hundreds of thousands of lives lost over the years at sea. And the centerpiece of this new creation is a new Jerusalem. But this is not the Jerusalem of old. Her sin and her rebellion have ended. The new Jerusalem is home to all the followers of Christ down through the ages who have lived and who have persevered in their faith. And she is said to be like a bride dressed for her husband and the picture is that of a bride's wedding day and wives women tell me is there any day on which you want to display your beauty any more than on your wedding day that's the picture of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven the new Jerusalem at the center of the new world is pristine and stunningly beautiful it is finally the city on the hill that cannot be hid because it is the place of righteousness, the city of God's dwelling. And folks, don't miss that the new world John was given to see is material. It's a physical reality. Sometimes we think our life in eternity will be non-material because we will have departed these mortal bodies 
We assume we will have no physical existence. That is not true. We will have a new and very physical material body. It will function much, much differently than this one does because this one is mortal. The body we're given will not be mortal. It won't need surgery or therapy or joint replacement or artificial limbs. We won't have to take medicine to aid in healing or to alleviate pain. It will be immortal, but it will be real and physical. We saw the example of it in Jesus' resurrection, folks. He was not a ghost. He was not a phantom. He was real. He was material. He showed the scars in his hands and in his side to Thomas, to doubting Thomas. That's the example of the life we're given for eternity and the new body. Here's the next one. A new relationship with God. Now listen to verse 3. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Now, isn't it true? From day one, God's real intention has been to live in a close relationship with human beings, with us. The ones he calls what? The crown of his creation. And the only ones created of whom God says they are made in my image. They're made to be like me. And God has yearned, he's longed for this close relationship with us. But we know what happened after the first human beings rebelled against God by dishonoring his instructions. What happened? Distance, separation, alienation began to define our human relationship with God. And they felt it so poignantly, they tried to hide from God as if they could keep their sin a secret. Adam and Eve set the mold for all of us. But they couldn't hide their sin from God. God came looking for them. He immediately hatched a plan for our redemption, for our coming home to him. He chose from among the peoples of the earth a specific people, Abraham and his descendants, and through them, he launched his purpose to reach out to all human beings to give us the opportunity to be redeemed and to come home to him. And the story has continued since then. At the right moment, God sent his son, Jesus, who took up human flesh and dwelt among us, who was one of us, who led us back to God. But Jesus, God in human flesh, God dwelling among us. You know, it's that big word we use in the run-up to Christmas all the time, right? What is that big word? Incarnation. God dwelling in human flesh. What happened? It was temporary, wasn't it? It was not eternal. The way we read that our life with Christ, our life in Christ, will be eternal. It's a story that's ongoing. It's a story in which God continues to seek us out, to be there for us. But notice what happens in the new world. God's passion for a close relationship with each of us is fulfilled. God's yearning to live in immediate proximity to us is completed. God's desire to dwell among his people is enacted. And when it arrives, folks, there's no end to it. It's permanent. It's eternal. In Revelation, we see the picture of the fully redeemed world in which everything is set right. We move forward in history, not backwards, forward in history to discover our beginning and to enter into the life God designed for us from the get-go. 
in this new heaven and new earth. And here's the last one. A new life. The life of the new world isn't anything like the life we experience now. All of the things that make life dangerous and painful and monotonous and tragic will be removed and chief among them. The greatest usurper of all, the greatest enemy, death. Listen to verses 4 and 5. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. It's hard for us to imagine a world in which there are no reasons for tears, isn't it? At least tears of grief. Maybe tears of joy will continue. Let's think about what this means. It means there's no suffering in the world due to malnutrition. No bloodshed due to violence. No wars over precious resources. No power struggles for who will have the greatest influence. No greed for money. No disappointments over broken dreams. No death because of dreaded diseases. No racial or gender-based discrimination or injustice. You see, without evil, without the harsh reality of death, our main reasons for sorrow and crying and pain are gone. We're completely set free to be the persons God always wanted us to be. The person God had in mind when he created us. And Revelation 21 gives us a glimpse of it, a foretaste. It's sort of like you know, the movie trailer that you see in the theater that tells you about the the movie that is yet to come. You know, when you watch that trailer, you're not watching the movie, are you? You're just watching a little bits and pieces of it, not the full movie and all of its development and all of its subtlety and all of whatever may be its complexity, okay? Michelle and I have been to see a couple of movies in, uh, I don't know, the last month or six weeks, and they made such an impression on us that when I asked Michelle if she could Give me the names of those movies. She couldn't remember any of them. You see, the only reason I asked her is because I couldn't remember them either. But while we were in those theaters, twice I saw a trailer for a movie I really want to go and see. It's called Dunkirk. It tells the story of the British troops and some French and some Belgians that were trapped on the beaches of France in the early days of World War II and all the people of Britain had to be mobilized, everybody who owned a boat, a flotilla of small boats to go across the English Channel to pick up these soldiers and bring them back because they didn't have a way to get them all back. Now think about the impact on world history I'm sort of a history buff so that's why I want to see it if Britain's entire army had been destroyed right there at the beginning of the war. And there's this big question, you know, nobody really knows for sure why did Hitler let up? He did let up and gave England the opportunity to organize this evacuation and for their armies to escape. Comes out in July. I can't wait. My eagerness to see it. I'm thinking about it a lot. My son told me he'd go to it with me. My wife didn't didn't jazz her, but my son told me he'd go. But the the desire, the yearning to see it is just palpable. You know, I can feel it. Folks, that's what God has given us in Revelation. He's given us this, this picture of what the future holds. And in chapter 21, you know, he showed us this marvelous image of the new world that's coming. And he's saying, just hang on to that. Live in hope. And he gives it to us as a way of encouraging us in faith to keep going And this is what they call hope, you know, this picture of the better future that God has in store for us. To put an exclamation mark on it, God tells John to write down some words. Listen to these words, it is finished. Where do you remember hearing that before in the Bible? Isn't that what Jesus said on the cross when he was near death? It is finished. Yes, he was thinking about having completed, nearly completed redemption's work. But don't you think his mind was fast-forwarding to to that world that his death and resurrection would make possible? 
to the new beginning that was out there. God told John to write down these words, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Folks, that is God himself. I know this is hard for us in our finite minds to kind of, you know, grasp and get a hold of. This is the God who had no beginning and no end, who always is, was, and forever shall be. Amen? Amen. Amen. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. See, when God is fully available to his people, no one will lack anything. We won't lack anything. You know, this yearning we have for more of God, to be closer to God, to know God better. The psalmist captured it, Psalm 42, which says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. That feeling. Or as Augustine of old put it, the heart is restless until it rests in thee. Every longing heart will have found the water of life in God. But there is a caveat. It says in verse 7, all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. See, there is nothing universal about salvation. Oh, it's universally offered to all, but it's not universally accepted by all. To live in this fully established kingdom of God, to be one of God's children forever, we have to belong to Christ, and we have to persevere in him. See, verse 8 tells us there will be a judgment to determine who will inherit God's kingdom forever. It's described at the end of chapter 20. Those who put their faith in Christ have their names etched in the Lamb's book of life. Those who did not have their names in the Lamb's book of life, who did not persevere in faith, were judged according to their deeds. And guess what? In every case, their deeds came up short for their sins spoke against them but to those who knew Christ who remained committed to him the new world was waiting now we have to ask why did God give us these words why did he inspire John to write about this vision why did God pull back the veil so far and let Saint John the Apostle John see it Well, part of it, we've already spoken about it, is to keep Christians encouraged. Folks, remember the end of the first century, on into the second and third century, these times were brutal for Christians. The persecution was so intense, and sadly, and honestly, some retreated. They walked away from their commitment to Christ. They renounced following him. So God wanted to encourage Christians and churches to persevere because a glorious future awaited them. But the other is to give us a vision to work toward. I don't mean that we can make this new world come into being or force it to arrive because we're ready when God is not. What I do mean is that God does not want us to wait passively to sit back to enjoy this life and say, oh, won't that be a wonderful day when it all happens? Until then, I'm just going to enjoy myself here. See, God wants us to mirror the values and the priorities of that world. He wants us to mirror those values and priorities in the world of the here and now. He wants us to work now with the power of the Holy Spirit for the realities that kingdom represents. He tells his children to start living in that kingdom before it arrives. The beginnings of it are already here. Do you know that Christ planted the flag for the new heaven and the new earth when he was here in the flesh? God calls us to be people of faith who trust him. That's what it's all about. To be people of hope who expect great things from him. To be people who love others in need around us, knowing that we're all created in his image. To be people of righteousness who seek God's will in everything we do. To be people of justice who insist on fair treatment for all people. 
to be people of compassion who come to the aid of those who are suffering, to be people of joy who live each day to the fullest for the glory of God, to be people of the good news who share it with others and give people the example of what it looks like in person. That's what it means, all of that, to eagerly await the coming of the new world. The world that we move forward to find our beginning in. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for this marvelous vision that was given to the Apostle John to strengthen our faith, to keep our hope alive, to show us that picture of what the future holds. Keep us strong. Keep us going. Inspire us and teach us in how to live in that kingdom and for that kingdom as we await its arrival. We thank you and we give you praise in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.